you can think intellectually in a no-think way. That's the art. It doesn't mean not to have any thoughts at all. It means not to be fooled by thoughts, not to be hypnotized by the forms of speech and images that we have for the world, not to be hypnotized by them into thinking that that is the way the world really is. Don't let words limit the possibilities of life. The easiest thing I've done was to get out from under the labels and to live the life that I live. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do it. When you don't know what's impacting you and it's, it's something that, that's holding you down and you're not aware of it, you live in a dominant culture that is designed to destroy your sense of self and your belief in yourself and, and you have to learn ways in which you can begin to connect with this power that you have within yourself to handle where you are. The key is to be constantly in a perpetual process of discovering the truth of who you are and fighting constantly to look for ways in which you can escape the inner conversation. Now it's the mental game. And that's where people get lost in life, get lost in that next level. You must get your self out of the sewer. No one's coming in the sewer to get you. It's dark, it's nasty, there's rats down there. It's your brain. You are the only person that can pull yourself out. The easiest thing in the world to do is to complain. The easiest thing in the world to do is to be negative. It takes work to have a perspective that see things on the right side of the coin. You gotta fight for that. It takes work to show up every single day and when things are not playing in our favor to say, you know what, man, I'ma still show up and I'ma give everything I got to it because I value what I'm a part of. It takes work to have the right perspective. Turn off things that can contribute to your fear. Turn a deaf ear to people that all they can do is talk about how negative things are because they have bought into the consciousness of the world. Start attending workshops, seminars, listening to tapes on a daily basis to begin to recondition your mind, to retrain your thinking. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. Listen to things that can empower you, that can enable you to create a new reality for yourself and a new life for yourself. Develop the interior core where it doesn't matter if people call you crazy. One of the things limiting you from your income, your impact, a world-class life. You care too much about what people think about you. Everyone has an opinion. Why let the opinions of other people deny you from a life that will make history? If you are distressed by anything external, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but to your estimate of it. And this you have the power to revoke at any moment. To Epictetus, all external events are determined by fate and are thus beyond our control, but we can accept whatever happens calmly and dispassionately. Individuals, however, are responsible for their own actions which they can examine and control through rigorous self-discipline. Suffering arises from trying to control what is uncontrollable or from neglecting what is within our power. As part of the universal city that is the universe, human beings have a duty of care to all fellow humans. The person who followed these precepts would achieve happiness if you choose, you are free. If you choose, you need blame no man, accuse no man. All things will be at once according to your mind and according to the mind of God. Richard Wright said it best. He said, the impulse to dream has slowly been beaten out of me through the experiences of life. So when you live in a culture that is designed to destroy your sense of self, to, where you are marginalized, where you, you have a feeling of being hopeless and powerless, and you're terrorized. I, I remember going downtown with my mother, and I saw a water fountain. I think I was about five years old, and I ran and I drank from the water fountain. All of a sudden, 
She grabbed me by the neck and said, don't you ever do that again and start punching me in the back of my head and my face and, and got me down on the ground, punching me relentlessly, uh, relentlessly. And I said, mama, please, it's me, mama, it's me, with this crazed look in her eyes. And then a white policeman came and he had a, a nightstick in his hand. He was hitting it in his left hand. He said, okay, all right, you beat that little nigga boy enough. Now, I won't have to beat him with this nightstick. And he walked away laughing. And my mother broke down and started crying. He said, Leslie, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, Mama, why'd you beat me like that? She said, these water fountains are for white only, son. And if that cop had hit me with his nightstick, he would have to kill me. I fought him until he killed me, and I left you and your brothers and sisters by themselves to raise themselves. I'm so sorry. And the book called Learned Optimism, Seelman talk about the fact that between ages zero and five, we determine what's available to us and what's not available to us. And so that was a defining moment. I knew there are certain things I could not do, certain places I could not go. They used to have signs on Miami Beach that said, Jews, dogs, and coloreds not allowed. And so now you have to operate within the constraints of, of the dominant society and the things that they've created for you. And it's a challenge to see yourself beyond that and to work to get outside of that even after those laws have changed because that has become so much a part of you, you unconsciously operate within the parameters of what has been put in place. Like you go, you're driving on the expressway to four or five and, and, and you'll get off on an exit that you weren't going in that direction, but you unconsciously did it because you've done it so many times that many people, because they're not making a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to think outside of what life has thrown at them, they end up doing the same thing over and over and over again. Einstein said that thinking that has brought me this far has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. And so through relationships, through reading, through studies, through goals and dreams beyond your comfort zone, it, it allows you to begin to live out of your imagination as opposed to out of your history. Disney said, the imagination is a preview of what's to come. And so as a kid, I, I dreamed a lot about taking care of my mother. I used to go with her to work, to clean homes, and, and she, she kept her children, and she cooked for these wealthy families. My mother could bake a sweet potato pie so good, you couldn't eat it with your shoes on. You had to take your shoes off so you could wiggle your toes. And I used to look at these big, beautiful mansions and said, Mama, what is it, Leslie? When I become a man, I'm gonna buy you a big, beautiful home just like this. Oh, you don't have to do this. I said, I know, but you didn't have to adopt us either. And you did. And so I'm here with you because of two women. One gave me life, the other one gave me love. God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. And because of her example and my love for her and the passion that I felt in my heart, I've got to do something to, to make her proud. I've got to do something to put myself in position to be able to take care of her. That drove me. Nietzsche said, if you know the wife of living, you can endure almost anyhow. You journey to Olympia to see the work of Phidias. And each of you holds it a misfortune not to have beheld these things before you die. Whereas when there is no need even to take a journey, but you are on the spot with the works before you, have you no care to contemplate and study these? Will you not then perceive either who you are or unto what end you were born? Or for what purpose the power of contemplation has been bestowed on you? Well, but in life there are some things disagreeable and hard to bear. And are there none at Olympia? Are you not scorched by the heat? Are you not cramped for room? 
Have you not to bathe with discomfort? Are you not drenched when it rains? Have you not to endure the clamor and shouting and such annoyances as these? Well, I suppose you set all this over against the splendor of the spectacle and bear it patiently. What then? Have you not received greatness of heart, received courage, received fortitude? What care I? If I am great of heart, for aught that can come to pass, what shall cast me down or disturb me? What shall seem painful? Shall I not use the power to the end for which I received it, instead of moaning and wailing over what comes to pass? If I show you that you lack just what is most important and necessary to happiness, that hitherto your attention has been bestowed on everything rather than that which claims it most, and to crown all that you know neither what God nor man is, neither what good or evil is, why, that you are ignorant of everything else, perhaps you may bear to be told. But to hear that you know nothing of yourself, how could you submit to that? How could you stand your ground and suffer that to be proved? Clearly not at all. You instantly turn away in wrath. Yet what harm have I done to you? Unless indeed the mirror harms the ill-favored man by showing him to himself just as he is. Unless the physician can be thought to insult his patient, he tells him. Friend, do you suppose there is nothing wrong with you? Why, you have a fever, eat nothing today, and drink only water. Yet no one says, what an insufferable insult. Whereas if you say to a man, your desires are inflamed, your instincts of rejection are weak and low, your aims are inconsistent, your impulses are not in harmony with nature, your opinions are rash and false, he forthwith goes away and complains that you have insulted him.